welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Well, I want to remind you, we don't come to church to hear from a man. We don't come to church to hear from a woman. We don't come to hear from the old or the young, the, the, the white, the brown, the black, whatever else, you know, uh, the big, the small. It doesn't matter. We don't come. We come into this place to hear from the teacher of the church, and that is the Holy Spirit. And so I want to encourage you to, to dig into the word of the Lord today. I know that it's going to bless you. I know that it's going to uh, bear fruit in your life if you grab a hold of it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me in standing? Father God, we come before you in this place, and Lord, we are just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house of the Lord. Father, your word says that when two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of us, and Lord, we thank you that your presence is in this place. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come into this place for entertainment, but God, we do come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the leader of this church, and so Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to minister to us today, to, to that your word would be a seed planted into our hearts, into our lives, Father, and it would be sown into good and fertile ground in our lives, Lord, that we would leave this place and we would bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us, your people, and Lord, we don't think of ourselves at any time as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father, with that, we ask that you bless the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ today and all throughout the week. And Lord, we thank you that you bless our brothers and sisters, Father, our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Presbyterian and, and Methodist and Episcopalian and Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Pentecostal and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon harvests and on the grove and sandals. Father, I thank you for Ecclesia Christian Center, on Emmanuel Baptist, on the Way World Outreach Center, on Abundant Living, Father, on Oak Valley, on Crossroads. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in the desert at Coachella, the rock and of Coachella Valley. Father, our brothers and sisters to the west of us in Riverside. Father, our brothers and sisters to the south of us in Temecula and Murrieta, as well as in San Diego. Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body, the body of Christ, working together to build the kingdom of God in this place and in our lives. And Father, to you be all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles, get them out, open them up. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians in the fourth chapter. Galatians in the fourth chapter. Now, as you're turning, I want to tell you a story. I want to start by giving you the title of tonight's message. And as I do that, I'll give you a story as well. The title of tonight's message is Mistaken Identity. A Mistaken Identity. Now, let me tell you a story as, we're talk, as, we're, as you're turning to Galatians. Now, there was a time when it was one of my day off, days off. Now, this is a, I'm going to pull a Pastor Jim move. Okay, This is a true story. One of my days off, you know, have you ever had those days off where you just didn't want to get out of bed? You didn't get out of your jammies or you didn't, you just, you know, you got that shirt on. You know, you, you guys know what I'm talking about? That one shirt that like, it's like 45 years old. Like it's not even your shirt. You don't even know where you got it from. And it's got holes all over the place. It's just raggedy, and, you know, it, but it's the most comfortable shirt. You know what I'm talking about? It's just, it's one, it was one of those days. It was my day off. And I remember I was just kind of lounging around the house. I was just looking raggedy, looking, looking all messed up. Didn't comb my hair. Didn't, it was just, just, just out, all out slob. Okay. And I remember my wife, she was out and about, and I had told her before she left that she needed to go get gas in her car because her car, her gas light was on. Now, my, my, my beautiful, my lovely, my darling wife always has this thing where she, she drives her car with a gas light on until like the very, very last moment. So I remember she came home after whatever she was doing that day. And the first thing she did when she came in the door is I asked her, I said, babe, did you get gas? No, I didn't get any gas. Said, okay. So I walked out to her car with the car keys, turned her car on, looked at it, and her car has one of those like computers that tells you how many miles you have left until you run out of gas. So I turned it on and it had like two miles, something dramatic. And I was like, oh, we got to go get gas right now. I know this because there was a previous story to this long, long ago when I ran out of gas in, one of, in, in my car, and it cost me $300 to have the engine flushed out because of all the dirt that it sucked up. So I just told my wife, let's go get gas. So I jumped in the car, she jumped in the car, and I was all raggedy. But you know what? You're going to the gas station. Nobody's going to see you. You're going to get out, get in, go back home. That was it. So I get out of the gas station. My wife gets out of the car. I think she went in to go get a soda or something from the convenience store. 
And as I'm pumping gas, I've never experienced this before, but as I'm pumping gas, I'm sitting next to my car, and all of a sudden I hear this beep, and the car locked. I'm pumping gas, the car locked. I'm thinking, okay, not a big deal. Stacy has the keys. So I asked my wife when she comes back in, you took the keys with you, right? No. So she, some, some way, however it happened, she locked her wallet, my wallet, her keys, my keys, her phone, my phone, everything we had in the car, and we were locked out at the gas station. Now, mind you, this was a very busy gas station in the city of Redlands. I would, I would suggest to say probably one of the busiest gas stations in the city of Redlands. So I'm thinking, like, oh, my goodness. So we go into the convenience store, and we, we ask the clerk, hey, listen, we just locked our keys in our car. We locked our wallet in. I mean, everything, we're, we're, we got nothing. Can we use your phone to call somebody to come get us so we can get a pair of keys and, and get out of here? So he let us use the phone. So my wife had to call her mom, who who could come and pick her up so that she could take her back to our house. Her mom lived in Riverside, so she had to call her mom from Riverside to come pick her up in Redlands to take her back to her house deep into Redlands so that we could break into our house because she didn't have a key, so that she could break into our house so that we could find the spare key so she could come back to the gas station to unlock the car so that we could get out of here and we could pay for everything. And, 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 and meanwhile, I'm raggedy. So, so my wife... Meets up with her mother-in-law. Mother, my mother-in-law comes and picks us up at the gas station. And, I, okay, I'm going to stay here with the car so that way nobody does anything. And I'm going to sit. So I go and I stand by the entrance to the gas station over to the side, not quite at the front door. And as I'm standing there, somebody comes up to me. Now, he was obvious in his attire. And, 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 and to be politically correct, I won't, I won't tell you uh, the, the title of what this person was. But he was obvious in his attire. He was obvious that he hadn't bathed in a while. He had uh, probably likely all of his possessions with him. If you know what I'm going, you know where I'm getting at with that. And so he comes up to me, to me and he stands right next to me. So I'm standing here. He's standing there. You know, you're kind of one of those like awkward conversations where you just say, hey, so I'm standing next to this guy and saying, how's it going, man? He looks over to me. Oh, it's going pretty good, man. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Then he asks me, is this your territory? <laughs> and I, I thought, what is he saying? And then he says to me, you wouldn't mind if I, if I hit these guys up, would you? And I went, no, 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 no. I, I'm not asking people for money. Oh, I'm locked out of my car right there. And he was like, oh, okay, man, have a good day. And he went and started going, you know, doing the, the gas station thing. I had a case of mistaken identity where somebody thought I was a panhandler because I was in my weekend, you know, my, my ghetto attire. The fact is, is that we have an identity. We all have an identity. And our identity in Christ is very specific what the Bible tells us. But we can get into a sense of a mistaken identity in our relationship with God. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So like me at the gas station, we can be Christians. We can go all throughout our lives and live in the status of a mistaken identity or to not reach the full potential that God has designed for us because we believe that we are who we are, but rather not who the Bible says we are. So I had to turn to the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians, in the fourth chapter, starting in number one of the fourth chapter of Galatians, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Galatia, and he says, now I say that the heir, now he says, now I say, because he's actually talking right off of the heels of the third chapter. The third chapter tells us that if we are in Christ, that we are all together one. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. Everybody is together in, in Christ is one. And if we are in Christ, he says that we are in the seed of Abraham and we are heirs to the promise of Abraham. Now, if you remember, God made a promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that his descendants would number, would be as num numerous as the stars in the sky. So we are heirs to that promise. And now he says, therefore, now... I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, he doesn't differ at all from a slave. Here's this person with an inheritance coming their way. Here's this person of status or of stature. But as a child, they differ. They don't differ at all from a slave. Why? Though he is the master of all. Verse number two goes on to say, gives us the ex example why. Verse number two. 
but he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So a child, even though he has a status, even though he has a, a name, even though he has an inheritance... He doesn't differ from a slave in the sense that he is a servant or he is subject to somebody over him or ruling over him or making decisions for him or her. And uh, until the time that is appointed by the Father. Now verse number 3 comes along and says that even so we, you and I, when we were children or we were, when we were immature, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. So when we were young in our maturity in Christ, we were in bondage of the elements of this world. Now verse number 4 goes on to say, but, who, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse number 5 goes on, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of as sons, so we were on the outside looking in, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die under the, on the cross, to be bound by the law, so that you and I, who are on the outside looking in, could now be on the inside or in the family as adopted sons and daughters of Christ. Verse number six, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Father, Father. Verse number seven, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So now you and I, our identity in God is an heir of God. Is, is that where we have an inheritance, that we have a title, we have a name, we have a position of authority given to us by God because of our birthright. So here's this identity. Here's this stature of, 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 our, of our being. Here's this, this, uh, this, this namesake for who we are. And God has intended for you and I to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. To be, the Bible tells us, uh, we are a, a royal priesthood, a peculiar nation. We are of royal descendants through God. So we have this identity. But here, as it goes further on, and we won't go any further, but here in Galatians... Paul begins to ask the church and he says, why is it that you know this having known God? And he goes on to say, and having been known by God, why is it that you go back to the old ways, to the old bondages that you once were under? Why do you go back to the old identity of who you once were when you are no longer a slave, but now you are royalty? They were suffering from a case of mistaken identity. And if you and I live a life of mistaken identity or if we don't grab a hold of who the Bible says we are, not who we think we are, not who society says we are, not what our bank accounts say we are, not what our jobs or our employers say we are, not what our relatives say we are, but rather who God says we are, who the Word of God says we are. If we live a life and we miss out on that or... Let me submit this to you. Or we don't fully comprehend that or live to the, the fulfillment of that. We miss out on what God has for us in life. And we look back at our lives and we wonder, why, why wasn't there more to it than this? What did I miss out on when really it's a case of mistaken identity? So tonight, here's what I want to do. I want to take you to some places. I want to take you through some thoughts. On, let's look at some things that would lead to an identity issue or a case of mistaken identity. Let's look at some things that will take us into an identity issue and then how we can correct them or how we can make them right in our lives or even this, how we can fall or, or get away from falling into the trap of living a mistaken identity. Let me tell you something. Not just is it us in our own flesh, in our own lives, struggling to find our identity. But let me tell you something. There are principalities of darkness out there, the devil and his angels, that would love nothing more for you to have a case of mistaken identity so that you don't live the potential that God has for you. So that you live a life robbed of blessing, a life robbed of grace, a life robbed of faith, a life robbed of the things that God has intended and has promised for you. But if you don't grab a hold of it, you miss out on it. So let's look at some things as a why we might have an identity issue and how to get out of it, 
or how to correct it or how to not fall into those traps. Are you with me tonight? So I'm going to make a statement. We'll complete it four times. How we can have a mistaken identity. How we can have a mistaken identity. Number one for tonight, how you and I can have a mistaken identity is to have a headline theology. Now you're like, Pastor Luke, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's all right. I'm going to explain that term, a headline theology. But let me tell you, sometimes I know uh, in San Bernardino, sometimes I know we throw out some words and they're kind of like, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't even really know what theology means. So let me just describe theology so we can start fresh all on the same page, okay? Theology is this, very simple. Theology is the study of religious faith, practice, and experience, especially the study of God and God's relation to the world. So you and I, we can fall into an identity issue by having, uh, or by having a headline theology or a headline study of the Word of God. Now, when I say a headline study, what does that mean? Well, you and I live in a very fast-paced society. Agreed? We, I, I was going to go to say that we live in a fast food society, but that's kind of like a decade-old statement. People are starting to realize that fast food may not be good for us, so a lot of people are going back to, to the roots of eating things. So we don't really live, I don't want to say we live in a fast food society, but we do live in a drive through society, where even good food can come in a drive through window, where it's made fresh, but it's made in three minutes, where we live in a society where we have information at our fingertips. You don't have to wait for the Sunday newspaper anymore to come to find out what happened during the week. There are so many avenues in our lives that we have headlines or we have information being inundated to us on a constant basis. And I, I adopted this phrase, headline theology, because I started to look at how I read the news. And I'm a guy, I think men in, in general are kind of this way. I don't need to know the details. I just want to know that it happened. And so I open up the little apps on my phone and I start to read the news. And I can read the headline and that's about all I need to know for that whole news. I don't need to know all the details. I don't care about all the nitty gritty. All I need to know is that this happened over here and this happened over there and this happened over there. And I feel like I got all the information I want. We live in a society, for those of you who are tech savvy, we live in a society of 140 characters or less. Some of you are like, I don't get it. Well, that's, that's, if there's a little website. It's very small. It, it's on the downloads underground. It's called Twitter. And, and the only way to post it, you have to post something on, with 140 letters or less. We live in a fast-paced society. Don't call me, text me. Right? So we are used to, we have become accustomed to getting things at a moment's notice. And we find ourselves, or we can find ourselves with an identity issue by looking at theology with that mindset that I can grab it at a moment's notice, that I only need to know the headlines. I don't need to know the nitty gritty. I don't need to get in there and get deep into the things of God. I don't need that. All I need to know is just tell me what I should believe and I'll say I believe it. And we find ourselves, or we can find ourselves in an identity crisis from those very thoughts. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter in the first chapter. Peter's speaking to the church. Did you know, I've heard it said, I should say, rather than did you know, I've heard it said that there is more information in our day and age, there is more information in one article or one issue of Time magazine than somebody in the 1900s would have in an entire lifetime. Did you know that in World War II, that those who were fighting against the Nazi regime in Europe had no clue about concentration camps until they came face to face with them? They didn't even know what they were. You and I think, look at that in, in hindsight, and we see all the videos and the documentaries, and we've been taught about it, but information did not spread the way it does nowadays. And we have become so accustomed to having things at our fingertips. I, I, I will say I am the worst. My wife will attest to this. That if there's a song or if there's a, a, an actor and I think, man, they were in what movie? And I'll just sit there and, oh, it drives me nuts. Oh, what movie were they? Then I'll, I'll just whip out my phone and I'll go to imdb.com and I'll type in their name and say, ah, that's it. They were in this, 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 this. I know everything about their life in 45 seconds. And so we have this headline mentality. Let me get it. Let me just get the, the surface level. In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, 
First Peter, the fifth chapter. I'm sorry, first Peter, the first chapter, excuse me. First Peter, the first chapter, fifth verse. First Peter, the first chapter, fifth verse says this. But for this very reason, this very reason, speaking in the first few verses before that, Peter was saying that you would grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and expand in your maturity of your thinking. So in your growth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in the growth of your maturity, for that reason, giving all diligence. Now can somebody tell me, what does diligence mean? It means hard work. It means putting an effort into it. Look at your neighbor and say, diligence. Now Peter says, with all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. Self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours, if you possess them, if you have gained a hold of them and abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful. You will not suffer from mistaken identity. You will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, if you have these things, you won't stumble and fall. But the word there is diligence. With all diligence, add. With all diligence, add. And what Peter, he, he names some traits. He names some thoughts. He names the things that you and I have got to study to get our, our, our lives in tune with. And you know what that word diligence means? That we have got to put an effort into it. That we can't simply get by in this day and age, in our lives, with this walk and this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, with a headline theology that says, I believe so and so, or I believe this, or I believe that, because my pastor says so. But rather, to have the idea in the mindset that says, I believe this, I stand on the word of God, not because my pastor says so, but because my pastor showed me and I got into the word and I added to my faith knowledge, to knowledge virtue, to virtue self-control, to self-control perseverance and kindness and brotherly love. With diligence, I put an effort into it. You and I cannot live a life of headline theology. I love this example. I was so glad that he played tonight. I, 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 have a, I have a hero. There's a hero that we have here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And, and, and this hero is Cameron. How many guys just love Cameron? I'll tell you, Cameron is like the biggest underground, greatest guitar player. I, I, I just I love it. I love watching Cameron jam. And if you've ever seen Cameron on the screens, if you've ever seen Cameron uh, when he's jamming, I love this. You know where I'm going with this? You've seen Cameron as he kind of leans back. You ever seen Cameron? I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's here or, or where he's at, but you know, Cameron kind of, he kind of leans back into it and then he closes his eyes and then his fingers just go nuts. Have you ever seen that? Just, and you're just kind of like, how do you move them that fast? And, and then you know the more Cammy gets into it, the more his face kind of goes off and he's just, and he's into it. He's feeling it. He's immersed in it. Well, you know, I play the guitar. I play the guitar. But I don't expect that I could pick up a guitar and right off the bat just close my eyes, feel it, and just start jamming. You know, just go nuts. Because that doesn't come overnight. That doesn't come overnight. Somebody like Cameron with, with the talent that he has to play that guitar has immersed himself, has soaked himself in that guitar to the point now where he doesn't have to look at it. He doesn't have to see it. He doesn't have to look at the pages of the notes on the, on the music sheet, but rather he can feel it. It's on the inside of him. And so he closes and he becomes united with those six strings and he tilts his head back and he just goes to town. And it sounds good. It's logic, it's common sense to you and I, but we think that we can just get immersed in the Word of God and we can just pick up the guitar or the, the thought process of the Word of God and just start jamming on it. But we have to start by immersing ourselves in the Word of God. We have to start by engulfing ourselves into the precepts and the thoughts of God so that we know exactly what the Bible says about us and exactly what the Bible says about our identity. James in the fourth chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead. James in the fourth chapter, very familiar verse. James says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
Stop basing your, your theology. Stop basing your beliefs off of what somebody else told you and get into the word of God for yourself so that way when life comes, when somebody comes and challenges your identity, you know who you are. And when you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Immerse yourself in the things of God. Are you with me today? So we're talking about things that can take us or what, how we can have a mistaken identity. Number two for tonight. Number two, how you and I can have a mistaken identity is that we have to be or we can be lazy in our liberty. Lazy in our liberty. The statement that you and I hear in the church circles in our day and age is this. Well, I'm not bound by the law. I'm not under the law, the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law. I'm not bound by the law. So now that creates this liberty inside of us as people, as human nature, to, to, to seek the path of least resistance. And so now we've been given this grace of God and this liberty in our lives and we become lazy in it and we do the things that are easiest to us rather than the things that are designed by God for us to do because we don't have to. And we have got to not allow ourselves to be lazy in our liberty. The Bible says we're not subject to the law. So we, we can't use that as a crutch to say that. Paul did tell us that the law pointed out our imperfections, that we are aware of our sin because of the law, but we're not under it. But what that means is that means that you and I, in our liberty, we don't serve God and we don't live this life that Christianity calls us to live because we have to or because the rules of religion tell us to, but rather because of the grace of God, because of the justification by faith, we live this life because we want to. And that it's not a, a, a set of rules and regulations. Because you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. You're looking at it in the negative rather than in the positive. And whenever we focus on the negative, it will only bring us down and cause identity issues in our lives. Now in Romans, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Romans in the 6th chapter. Romans in the 6th chapter. Paul the Apostle is speaking to the subject of the law in Romans in the 6th chapter. Romans in the 6th chapter, in verse number 15, Romans 6, 15, Paul says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but, and, but under grace? Because we don't have the law, should we sin? Or does that allow us to go and do whatever we want to do? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey... You are that one's slaves whom you obey. In other words, what he's saying is that who you follow, you are servants of that, uh, that school of thought. So whatever you follow in your life, that identifies you with who you are. You are a slave to this or a slave to that. And Paul uses the example, a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Because we are subject or underneath that which we follow. Are you not that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart this form of doctrine, the word of God that has been delivered, and you have been set free from your sin. You became slaves of righteousness. Paul goes on to say, I speak this in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Paul says, I'm just giving you this example in something that you would understand because you can't quite grab a hold of the spiritual concept of this. So you and I are servants to whatever school of thought we follow. Whether it is, I can do whatever I want to do. Well, then guess what? That is what identifies you. Or I can do all things that God tells me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I am no longer he who lives, but now I live for Christ. That is who you are subject to. You have the decision there in your life. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members of slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, it goes on to say in verse number 19, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Present your bodies as servants of righteousness, not because you have to, because you want to. Because the grace of God, the liberty of God has freed you from the old, 
So now you have the free will choice, but now, because you have the free will choice, now you say, I will no longer be a, a slave to that person. I will no longer be a slave to that mistaken identity because I know where it leads, but now I will find myself a servant to righteousness for holiness in my life so that I can live to the potential that God has designed for you and I. Think of it like this. I can eat whatever I want. As a matter of fact, all throughout the Bible, Paul talks about this as a subject of eating things, about food. It was a big issue in those days. I can eat. I had this habit of eating cookies and Reese's, and Reese's peanut butter cups right as soon as I would go to bed, right before I, my wife and I would get a big old ice cold glass of milk. Big old glass. I mean, I was greedy. Big old glass of milk. And then I, I was greedy. My family can attest all my life, I'm the cookie monster. You, you, put a bo you put a box of Oreos in front of me, I don't have self-control. There's no no button. My wife says, Luke has no off button. And it's just Oreo, 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 Oreo. And all of a sudden I look at the Oreos and they're gone. Oh my goodness, I ate a case. You know what though? I can do that. I can do that. I can eat as many Oreos as I want. I can eat as late as I want. I can eat whatever I want. But the fact of the matter is, is that I can eat as many Oreos as I want. I can eat as late as I want. But there's, there's some consequences to me doing that. And that was for me to gain 30 pounds in six months. And so now I don't eat Oreos at 9 o'clock, not because I, I don't have to, but now because I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I don't want to. <laughs> we are not bound by chains to this law of Christ, but rather we are bound by the liberty that God has given us through the justification through faith to say, I want to live this way. This is my identity, not that mistaken identity. <laughs> don't focus on the negative, church. I'm not subject to that anymore. I don't have to listen to that. I don't, that doesn't apply to me in this day and age. That was the Old Testament law. I don't have to tithe. That was the Old Testament. Don't focus on the negatives and the I don't have tos. Why? Because you're focusing on the things that will pull you away from the God. It doesn't mean you and I, yes, are not under the law of Moses. But that doesn't mean that we're not under the law. That doesn't mean that you and I are lawless in our lives. Or that we're not under a governing authority. Or that we don't have a moral life. But rather, now you and I are under the law of Christ. The Bible tells us the perfect law of liberty in the book of James. There is a law of Christ, a set of standards that Christ has set that we are bound to live by. In 1 Corinthians, in the ninth chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead. In the New Living Translation, Paul says, When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I, I have in my little notes a little uh, segment there, because they don't know it. Hey, church, chances are you don't know the Mosaic law. You didn't grow up in that. So Paul says, when I'm, not, when I'm with those who don't follow the Jewish law, I don't follow the Jewish law. I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I don't ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Yes, we're free, but it doesn't mean that we have the ability or the right to do that because our identity is here, not there. And living in our sin nature, following the path of least resistance, will get us into a case of mistaken identity where you and I will miss out on the things of God in our lives. We will miss out on the blessings of God in our lives. We will miss out, church, on the, on the financial blessings of God when we say, I'm not, that's of the law, I don't have to. You shouldn't do it because you have to. You should do it because you want to. We can't get caught up in our liberty. Let it become a crutch for us. We're talking about how we can have a mistaken identity. Number three, how to have a mistaken identity? To stand on faulty faith. To stand on faulty faith. You want to have a mistaken identity? You want to have an identity crisis in your life? Stand on faulty faith. You and I have all been there before in our lives. Listen, we've all been there. I've been there. Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah, I know they've been there. We've all been there. We're human. Where we've said, I'm believing for this. But in the deepest, darkest depths of our hearts where we believe nobody else can see, we think it's the secret place of our lives, we say, can it be done? Is this real? Can this really happen? But God knows everything inch of our body. God knows every secret place of our body. The Bible says that the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, divides the bone and the marrow. 
It, the, the, Lord, the word of the Lord can go in, and God knows our thoughts and our intentions. And if you and I stand on a faulty faith or a faith of doubting and of, of, of complacency, of, of inaction, we will find ourselves in the position of an identity issue or a mistaken identity and wonder, why is it that God isn't coming through in my life? Standing on a faulty faith. In James, the first chapter, I'll go ahead and put this up on the overhead. James, the first chapter. Fifth verse. I, this is like my staple verse, my staple verse. I mean, anytime anybody ever comes to me, I, this is like the verse I go to. Because it's always for advice. It's always for, what do I do in this situation? James, the first chapter. Verse number five. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, to give all li who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no Doubting. Everybody say doubting. doubting. Come on, say it louder. Everybody say doubting. doubting. He says, ask in faith. God will give it to you liberally without reproach. He's not going to take it back, but you have got to ask with no doubting. You have to have an assurance in your heart. You have to say, listen, when I ask, I know that God delivers on his promises. And when I ask for it, he's going to give it. Okay, why? Because look what he says. Let him ask with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse number seven, for let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. If you ask and you doubt, you are missing out on the identity. You are missing out on the nature of God. You are missing out on the message of God because God says you have got to have a firm faith, not a faulty faith. So you've got to shed your light of doubt. Well, Pastor Luke, how do I get rid of the doubt in my life? Going back to number one, that headline theology. Chances are you have doubt because you're not studying about what you're believing. Because the more you get into the Word of God, the more you build your foundation. Hey, the bigger foundation you have, the more solid it is, like Pastor Dan talked about, when the world comes and tries to shake you up. That's why we have foundations that dig deep into the rock, like Jesus says. Because you've got to stand firm in the Word of God. Peter, as he stepped out of the boat, you recall the story of Peter as he was in that storm and Jesus was walking on the sea. And G Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus says, come. And you know the story. Peter puts his foot over the, over the sea and begins, to, the Bible says, begins to walk. And he looks around and he sees the waves and the wind and he loses sight. He loses focus of Jesus Christ. He loses his identity his security, and the Bible tells us Peter begins to sink. Lord, save me. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you have little faith. The interesting thing about that story, the interesting thing if you read about some of the significant, the significant events in Jesus' life is there are these huge events followed by right immediately afterwards a case or an instance of somebody's faith being tested. Jesus had just multiplied the bread and the loaves. Peter had just seen Jesus take up bread and loaves that, that couldn't possibly feed 5,000. And Jesus miraculously did it. He saw it. He felt it. He grabbed it in his hands. He collected the, 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 the things that were left over. He saw this impossible miracle of God. This great defining moment in Jesus' ministry. And immediately after this great defining moment in Peter and Jesus' life, when Peter looks at Jesus and says, you are the Son of God, now his faith is on the trial. And Peter gets Lost in the waves in the sea. Don't you know, church, that you're going to have triumphs in your faith? Don't you know you're going to have great moments in your life where you're going to say, wow, the Lord conquered. I tell you, God has shown up. And right immediately then, your faith will be on trial. I've seen it all, all the time in church, in our services, especially it's, it's magnified in the young adult service. We'll have these great moves of God where people are on their knees weeping and worshiping before God. Numbers like we couldn't believe. And then the next week, less than half of them are there. And you're just like, oh. Your faith is on trial. Your faith is on test. But don't lose your foundation. Don't grab a hold of a faulty faith. Let me give you the recipe for a faulty faith, a little cooking recipe. A recipe for faulty faith is this. Say a prayer based on headline theology. Sprinkle it with a dash of doubt. And bake it in the oven of idleness. And you will find a perfectly concocted failure of faith. The recipe for failed faith is say a prayer based on headline theology because you don't know what the Bible says. Sprinkle some doubt over it. 
Bake it in the oven of time of, of, of idleness, meaning you're not doing anything about your faith, and you will find yourself the perfectly concocted method of faith in its failure. James, in the second chapter, says, But what do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We know this statement. Faith in its essence takes work. It takes work. It takes time. It takes an effort to put into it. You and I have got to build a foundation of faith that is not faulty, that is not on the sand, but rather that is built on the word of God, that is built on the rock of Jesus Christ, that is built on the foundations of the word of God so that when life comes and it shakes us away, nothing will take us away from our identity in Christ because it will come. The storms will come. Last one for tonight. How we can have a mistaken identity. Number four, keep that self-sufficient attitude. You and I want to have a mistaken identity? Go ahead and keep that self-sufficient attitude. I don't have to say much about this. You and I know that the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If we want to find ourselves in a failure of identity or to find ourselves wondering why we're not living up to the potential that God has for us, just keep on trucking with that self-sufficient attitude that I can do this on my own. Right when we think we're all that, we find out we're nothing. Right when we think we're all that, we find out that we're nothing. You know, I was fishing. One of the things I love to do, it's like, I just, it, it, some pastors, a lot of pastors play golf. That's like their, their, their escape or their, their thing is golf. I, I, I'm not a golfer. I, don't, I, I, I just can't stand paying money to hate myself. <laughs> so one of the things that I've always liked to do is I, I like fishing. I love to go fishing. I love to be outside and be in the wilderness. And, and, and particularly, I, I, I love to fly fish. And my brother-in-law and myself and my, my wife's two brothers and myself, we always go. And I, I've got this little thing going with my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law, he's, he's really slow to get motivated in the morning. He's really slow. He gets up and he kind of moseys around the house. He gets up and he kind of takes his time. So I'm sitting there by the stream like waiting for him and he's late or he calls me like an hour after we were supposed to meet. I'm on my way. And then when we get to the stream or when we get to the lake to set up our gear, he kind of takes his time. He always forgets to, 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 to put his line through all of the eyes of his fishing pole and he's got to take everything back and do it again. And and it's, it's like this ongoing thing with him and I, this ongoing joke that I'm already out there fishing and I've already caught fish by the time he's even set up. And so him and I went out to this lake recently, and, and I was kind of like, you know what, in my head I was thinking like, all right, you know, I'm the better fisherman here. I'm the better one. I, I take this more serious than he does. This is my thing. This is like, he just enjoys it, but this is like my principal thing. So we got to the lake, and we set up all our gear, and I made it a point. I'm going to go fast. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get out into the water before they're even touching the water. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to show them. Boom! I catch a fish and be like, see, I told you. I get out there, I'm casting, I'm casting, I'm doing my thing, casting, 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 doing my thing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Two hours, two and a half hours, I am dying here. And over there is my, my 13-year-old little brother and then my, my, my wife's other brother. And they are just ripping them in left and right. I mean, like, they're not even casting. They're just dabbling their, their fly in the water and the fish are coming and it's like, and you can just hear them. You know, you just hear them over on the side of the lake. <laughs> giggling and they're laughing and I'm just like ah! <laughs> and you know it's it, it, it that's the that's the nature of it but I'll tell you I learned I tell my parents I learned more about God and fishing sometimes than anywhere else and I remember I sat back that day and I just said God I thought I was I thought I was it I thought I had attained it. I thought that I had mastered it I thought that I had perfected it I read all the books Lord I thought that I was the man I got nothing I got nothing, Lord. Forgive me. And I actually said, Lord, forgive me for my pride because it was inside of me. It didn't matter what they, they didn't know what I was thinking, but I knew what I was thinking. And I said, God, forgive me, my, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this man that I am? Because I can't seem to shake this dumb pride in my life. And God, like when Jesus told Peter to cast to the other side of the boat, right then, things started to change. And then at the end of the day, see, I'm going to get prideful again. At the end of the day, my brother was like, dude, how did you get so many? So now next time I go, I'm not going to catch anything because I'm going to have to go repent again. But when we grab a hold of that pride and we think, you know what, it's all about me. I'm the cat's pajamas. I got it all. Man, I, I've done this faith thing. I can believe God for my finances. I can believe God for my healing. I got this. Right when we think we got it all, that's when we realize we got nothing. 
because it's not about us. It's not about our ability. It's not about our works. It's not about our goodness. It's not about how good we are. It's not about how religious we look. It's not about the clothes we wear. It's not about the money we have in our wallets. It's not about anything like that. It's all about God. It's all about God. It's all about God. In Proverbs, the 28th chapter, little proverb, it just says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. The Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. Whoever walks in the fear of God, whoever walks realizing that it's God, not me, in control, they will be delivered. They will be sustained by God. But when we trust in our own self and we say, hey, listen, it's all about me. I, I know where I'm going with this. Then we realize that we've got nothing. We realize that we've got nothing. How you and I can have a mistaken identity to have a headline theology. Don't, don't base your beliefs, guys. Please don't base your beliefs on Googling things. Off of a blog. Off of Yahoo Answers. Or anything like that. How, what does the Bible say about get into your word and find out about it? Don't read and so what somebody else says, well, I think it says this. And then say, okay, that's good enough for me. Get in and make the decision for yourself. How you and I can have that mistaken identity is to get lazy in our liberty. Well, I'm, under, I'm not under the law, so I can do whatever I want. I can go and drink, eat, and be merry. You know what? Don't do it because you have to. Do it because you want to. Follow the, the goodness of God and the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, because you want to, because you want to be closer to God, because you want to draw near to him and become more of a reflection of him. How you and I can have a mistaken identity how you and I can have that mistaken identity. Number three, and I forgot the wording, is to stand on faulty faith. Don't, don't build your faith on the sand. Build your faith on a rock. Don't build it on doubt and idleness. Get out there, dig into the word of God and base your faith on the word of God and stand firm and start doing something about it. Start, start doing something towards it. I'm believing God for a job. Your faulty faith says, I'm believing God for a job, so I'm going to sit here and wait for a job to fall into my lap. Rather, you should be believing God for a job and get out there and start doing something about it. Right. Doing something about it. I'm believing God that I'm going to have an impact in this church and this freedom for our future campaign and that God's going to bless me and my wealth and my family and everything and it's going to be generational. Well, don't wait for God to drop the blessing in your lap, but get out there and start doing something about it because faith without works is dead and you'll find yourself in a mistaken identity wondering, God, where were you? Finally, how we can find ourselves in a mistaken identity, keep that self-sufficient attitude. Live that way. You'll find yourself robbed of your identity, but rather, look what it says in Romans 8 chapter, and we'll finish with this. I'll put it up on the overhead. For if we live according to the flesh, we die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption to whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that way we may also be glorified together. Your identity is not that this is as good as it gets. Your identity is not that I am at the top of my game. Your identity is not, well, I guess this is all there is to life. Why? Because that right there is a case of mistaken identity. And God wants you to go further down the road of success with him, further down the road of development in your relationship with him. And you will see that as your identity begins to be formed by the things of God, that blessings will follow because God says that we as earth Earthly parents want to bless our kids. How much more than does God want to bless his children? You and I at the adoption, crying out to God, Abba, Father, Lord, you are our God. I don't care what I was. I'm not on the outside looking in. I'm on the inside. And that is my identity in Christ. Don't settle for today. Don't settle for where you're at today. Don't settle for your kids right now. They're going to go even further. Even if they're serving God, don't settle. 
They'll go further. Your kids, kids, your kids, kids, kids. Generations like we talked about today. God has a plan for you, but you've got to grab a hold of your identity in him so that you can live to fulfill what God has for you. Did you guys get something out of the word tonight? Hey, listen, let me do one more thing. Please don't get up, don't walk around. Give me a moment more of your attention. I promise I won't hold you, keep you back for any longer or just a few more minutes. Let me just say something. We're talking about a case of mistaken identity. And you know what? There might be some of you in this place that have a mistaken identity in the think, in the thought that you think you're going to get to heaven when reality is, is you may not be there, may not be headed there. So let me ask you this question and let's talk about your identity in, in God. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a simple question. Let's go over those answers that some of you might have had in your heart. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, hope, or want your way into heaven? You can't get there that way. You can't think, you know, you can't because you hope so or because you think so or because you really want to get there. God's not going to look and say, well, you know, they wanted it bad enough. I'm going to let them into heaven. You can't get to heaven because you think so, because you hope so or because you want to. Hey, did you know there's nowhere in the Bible that says because you were raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion, that, that means that, that, fit, that you fit into a classification of Christian? It means that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. You can't get to heaven because you were default or by default you're a Christian because you weren't raised any other way. No, it doesn't work that way. Hey, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, I don't even know about heaven or hell. I'm not sure if it's real or not. The reality is, is whether you believe in heaven or hell, it doesn't matter. It's real. It's a very real place. And because you can't see it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, you might have grown up in a place where you never saw semi-trucks. But you can go stand on the slow lane of the freeway and lo and behold, you'll meet one face to face just because you think in your head that hell isn't real doesn't mean it's not. It's a very real place. Heaven is a very real place. You know, but you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, my parents took me to church as a child. I was baptized or christened as a baby. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. All my life I went to church. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. I got a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. Here I am tonight sitting in church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to go to heaven? People who go to church go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that those who go to church go to heaven? Why? Because there's more than just sitting in service. There's more than just being baptized as a baby or going to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. There's more than just wearing a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Hey, there's more than just having a tattoo of Scripture or a Jesus tattoo somewhere on your body. You, got, you can't get to heaven that way. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth, to not beat around the bush with tradition. You can't get to heaven because you sit in church. There's more to it than that. Well, but Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I've never robbed uh, the 7-Eleven. I don't cheat on my taxes. I give to charitable organizations. I've done more good in my life than bad. Good people go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Bible where you find that good people get to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because it's not the way to get there. The, the fact is, the truth of the matter is, it's God's heaven. The only way to get into God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus says to the religious leader of, a, of his day, as he was speaking to him, he says, you must be born again. Now you've heard that term. You think, oh man, you're talking about that weirdo, radical, out of control, crazy Christianity. I don't care what Hollywood, popular culture, society is made of that term. It doesn't matter what they say. They have no concept of God. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you have given God all of your heart and you have given God all of your life. That's it. There it is. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. And God's not after, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who he is, yet they're not finding themselves in heaven. Why? Because it's more than that. It's about all of your heart. It's about all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you in the word of God. In the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I gather together, congregating, hearing the word of God, doing good things. And he says to the church, I know your works. And when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me describe it to you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ like this. You're a little bit in and you're a little bit out of your relationship. You're a little bit up and you're a little bit down. You're kind of floating around, in and out. 
occasional church attendance, doing some of God's thing, doing some of your own thing. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy the things of God. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the things of the world. You're kind of riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Well, then how do we get there? Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. The only way we can get there is God's way. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one goes to the Father except through him. God has made a way through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And he says, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. And whoever denies me before men denies, I will deny him before my Father. In a moment, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to give him all of your heart, to give him all of your life. And here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible, just like that, real loud. And if that's you in this place and you want to make Jesus Christ the personal Lord and Savior of your life, you want to ensure your place in heaven in just a moment when we do that all together, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pop your hand up. I want you to be bold. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go forward for God. I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to leave hell behind and make sure that I get into heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. You might be saying, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. The person that I came with is going to know where I stand. They're going to know all about me. I don't know if I can do that. You know what? You might be embarrassed, but wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like this, the church? The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. Only you can choose to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. He's already done everything he could to ensure you get into heaven. Hell was not designed for you. It was designed for the devil and his angels. But you can make the choice to go to heaven or hell today throughout your life by either accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The decision's yours. God, he's already done everything he could. Jesus died a beaten, bloody mess on the cross, a spectacle for all to see so that you and I could freely choose him today to be our Lord and Savior. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hand if you've never given them all your heart? You've never given them all of your life? In just a moment, when I count to three, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you're not sure. You've done this when you were a kid or something like that. You never really followed through with it. Maybe you went through with it at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade, but you never really followed through and live in that life. Get your hand up. Make sure today, don't leave this place without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Who should raise their hands today? If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, been living a life of mistaken identity today, get your hand up. Let's go forward in your relationship with God and go forward in the identity that God has for you today. I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge it, and I'll put it right back down. If that's you all across this auditorium, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up. The Spirit of God's in this place. If that's you in this place, Go ahead, and when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it. If you're watching by television, you're watching online at home, you pop your hand up wherever you're at. If you're out there in the foyer, or if you're out there walking the hallways, listen to what I'm saying, stop what you're doing and get your hand up today and make that profession. You, what you're doing, you're just saying, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out. Today is your day. Here we go. Ready? One, two, Three, let me see the hands in this place today. I see you right there. I saw the hand. Two, I see the hand. Three, I see you right there. Three wise hands in this place today. Where I see, four, I see you right there. Five, I see you right there. Five wise people in this place today. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Anybody else? Six, seven, I see you right there. Eight, I see you. Nine, I see you. all of you guys right there, back there. Nine wise people, I see you. You can put your hands down. Nine wise people. Anybody else in this place today? If you know there's nine, where are you at? Number 10, wondering, man, I wonder if I should. You need to get your hand up and go forward in your relationship with God. Don't leave this place today without making sure. Come on. If that's you, the Spirit of God's moving in your heart today. I know you're in this place. Come on. Go and pop your hand up so I can see it. And I'll, we'll move forward in this place today. Nine wise people. Anybody else in this place? Anybody else in this place today? Well, praise God for nine wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. You raised your hand because you're serious about God. And if you're serious about God, I want to ask you to do something bold. You said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all of your life. 
You don't get saved by raising your hand. Remember I said you said, I want to give him all my heart, all my life. You get saved by giving your heart, giving your life to Jesus Christ. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. Let us get some things into your hand. If you're serious about God, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, your purse, a friend if you need a friend. Whether you're old or young, whether you're in the front or the back, it doesn't matter. Wherever you're at, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come and meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. So let's all stand, please. Nobody leave at this time. And if that's you, come on. You can come wherever you're at. If you raise your hand, you can come come on you can come Jesus I believe you can come come on in you Jesus I belong come on down come on down come on you can come you're not too old you're not too young come on you're the reason that I live the reason that I breathe Jesus I believe They're still coming. Come on, you can come. It's not too late. Wow, praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, guys, listen. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. It's, the birth, it's your new day, your birthday today. You're going to be born again. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel, like Noel, Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. What he's going to do is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I promise I'm as weird as it gets, all right? You got through me. You got through it all, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, okay? He's going to give you some literature, some things to help you get, get, get strong in the ways of the Lord. And then he's going to do one more thing. He's going to introduce a friend to you. We give friends away here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. We call them SPTs. You go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, somebody helps you build those muscles, make sure you don't waste your time at the gym. Well, we got spiritual personal trainers, some of these wonderful people behind you that are going to come alongside of you. They'll buy you a cup of coffee right before church. They'll teach you some things about the word of the Lord for five weeks to get you strong so that you don't go back to the life that you came from. You get strong in the ways of God and you don't have a case of mistaken identity, but you know who you are in Jesus Christ. So if you guys would just go right over there to your left, my right with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo!